Greetings, greetings, fellow who gives. Welcome to Doctor Who Literature, the new podcast taking you through the world of the target novelizations in publication order. My name is Jason, and I'm your host on this journey, this very long journey. Up until now, this podcast was just me, and we've only been discussing the Frederick Muller books from the 1960s, but all that's about to change. This week, we begin the target line proper, and we'll get to be here for well over a hundred more planned episodes. Next week, I'll start rotating in guest interviews to give you all a break from the sound of my voice. The basic thesis behind my podcast has been that the target books have extraordinary literary merit, particularly those written by the titans of the series, Terence Dix, Malcolm Hulk, many others. Of course, along the way, we'll reach Terence Dix's sometimes maligned late 1970s output when he was churning out about six or eight different hundred-page volumes a year. But I'll have some surprising opinions about those books, too, when the time comes. However, today, we're at the very beginning of Terence's novelization's career, with a 150-page epic that stands, even today, as his magnum opus. Let's get to it. Doctor Who and the Auton Invasion, televised as Spearhead from Space, written by Terence Dix from a teleplay by Robert Holmes, published in January 1974. Here's the back cover blurb to Doctor Who and the Auton Invasion. A mysterious shower of meteorites lands in Essex, and Brigadier Lethbridge Stewart of Unit has reason to believe that they have been deliberately aimed at the Earth's surface. The Doctor joins forces with the Brigadier and Liz Shaw in a desperate bid to prevent the nightmarish invasion of the sinister Autons. Living models of human beings, like waxwork dummies, their murderous behavior is controlled and directed by the Nestine Consciousness, a malignant, squid-like monster of cosmic proportions and indescribably hideous appearance. That's the back cover blurb to the 1980s Target Edition the physical copy of which I'll be talking about in a little bit. I'm a voracious reader. I usually have two or three books going at any one time, and here during the late stages of the pandemic, probably about four or five. However, as a failed humanities major who never quite lived up to his childhood dreams of growing up to be an English professor, I freely admit that I read more genre fiction than literature, more pulp novels than classics, more YA fiction than international literature. And this means I've read more books authored by Terence Dix than I have by Dickens, Dumas, The Brontes, Jane Austen, David Foster Wallace, and Juno Diaz all put together. Doctor Who and the Auton Invasion is a book of firsts. It's Terence Dix's first entry into the Doctor Who novelization range. It's the first original book put out by Target, accepting the reprints of the three Hartnell-era Frederick Muller novelizations that we discussed over the previous three episodes, and accepting Malcolm Hulk's Doctor Who and the Cave Monsters, which was released simultaneously to Auton Invasion. It's also an adaptation of the first televised Third Doctor story, and thus the first Third Doctor novelization. Dix was still working full-time as Doctor Who's script editor as he wrote this one, although he'd soon leave that gig, and would go on to spend most of the next several years churning out six to eight targets every 12 months. Many of those later targets would come to be seen as juvenile and disposable, though I'll have the opportunity to dispute that point over the coming months and years. His debut here is pretty special. It's got a longer page count, 150 pages, more detail, and an atypical chapter count, 10, compared to the usual 12-chapter format that Dix would later pioneer for four-part TV stories. Although Dix will not always be this good, books like this are why I've read him more than practically anybody else. As he often did in his early books, Dix adds a prologue. He dishes the space-tracking radar station intro from the Robert Holmes scripts from Spearhead from Space, and replaces it with a flashback to his own The War Games, to show us how Patrick Troughton's second Doctor regenerated into John Pertwee's third Doctor in the first place. 
This would have been necessary context at the time, especially for younger readers, as the War Games TV broadcast was already five years in the past, and wouldn't be novelized for still another five years after Autumn Invasion. Dix's opening sentences are his usual bit of masterfully economic word choice and foreboding scene setting. This is not a writer who makes you wait ten pages to get to the point. Here's the first sentence of the prologue. In the high court of the Time Lords, a trial was coming to its end. The accused, a renegade Time Lord known as the Doctor, had already been found guilty. Now it was time for the sentence. This is also the first time we get to see Dix's classic description of the TARDIS materialization sound. A strange wheezing and groaning filled the air. An old police box was appearing out of thin air. It took shape, becoming solid. The weird groaning sound died away, and the box just stood there, looking sad and lost in the moonlit clearing. Slowly, the door started to open. The word weird, by the way, turns up a lot in Terrence Dick's books. Probably I can devote a full episode just to that one word at some point over the coming months and years. Auton Invasion also has our first description of the Third Doctor himself. A local physician, examining the Doctor's body, takes a special note of his quote-unquote scarecrow wrists and ankles, an epithet appropriate both to John Pertwee's future acting role and to the scarecrow barb aimed by Pertwee at Troughton during The Five Doctors, a Dick's scripted story, by the way. And, of course, who could forget this? It was a strange face. Sometimes it seemed handsome and dignified, sometimes quizzical, almost comic. The seams and wrinkles, the shock of almost white hair, should have made it an old face, yet somehow there was a strong impression of energy and youth. That, by the way, is the long form of Dix's later description of the Doctor as a young old face with a mane of white hair. And, as is usual for him, Dix is never shy about taking pot shots at elements of a story, or of this case, the Doctor Who format in general. Writing this towards the end of his tenure as script editor, for most of which the third Doctor was exiled to Earth and employed as a scientific advisor to Unit, Dix has no problem giving Liz Shaw some added dialogue here about Unit being a silly James Bond outfit, thus casually trashing what had been his own life's work up to this point. I also like how the Doctor's first words here, rather than being shoes as on TV, are a continuation of the Second Doctor's protests during his trial in the War Games. This lends credence to my own pet theory and headcanon, that Pertwee begins Spearhead from Space playing the Doctor as Patrick Troughton, up until the moment he examines his own face in the mirror and realizes that he's not the Second Doctor anymore. Dix describes this nicely as the face of a stranger looking back at him. In Chapter 3, Pertwee also rubs his chin for about the first of perhaps 5,000 times that he'll do so in print over the coming years, and the first of three times in this one book alone. But Dix doesn't reserve his sharpest writing for just the Doctor and the TARDIS. He also frequently uses the POV of Liz Shaw to illustrate points about the other characters. She becomes our audience identification figure for the book. She's an outsider first recruited to unit against her will, and then forced to team up with the alien doctor, whose depth and breadth of knowledge far surpasses Liz's own, and she has like seven doctorates. So Dix frequently uses her to set the scene. Liz observes of the Brigadier, for example, that despite his stiff military manner, there was something very likable about the Brigadier. She's right about that. Meanwhile, the Brigadier himself, marveling at Liz's take-charge attitude, hurries after her at one point early in the book, quote-unquote, deciding not for the first time that he would never understand the ways of women. Just about the only downside to Dix's writing so many scenes from Liz's perspective is that Liz was a short-term companion, only on the show for one season, and only in four stories, two of which were novelized in the same month, January 1974. After that, it would be another decade, pretty much, before Liz Shaw returned to the target line. So, if you love Liz Shaw and the novelization, The Auton Invasion, don't get too used to her. Figures from the Institute of Space Studies, Baltimore. Do you realize that in our section of the galaxy, there are over 500 planets capable of supporting life? 
Why is Earth any more likely to be attacked now than during the last 50,000 years? In the last decade, we've been sending probes deeper and deeper into space. We've drawn attention to ourselves, Miss Shaw. Aren't you being a bit alarmist? Since UNIT was formed, there have been two attempts to invade this planet. Really? We were lucky enough to be able to stop them. There was a policy decision not to inform the public. Do you seriously expect me to believe that? It's not my habit to tell lies, Miss Shaw. I'm sorry, but it is a fantastic story. We were very lucky on both occasions. We had help from a scientist, the great experience of other life forms. Really? Who was this genius? Well, it's all rather difficult to explain. We used to call him the Doctor. Until his death in September 2019, Terence Dix remained a living legend. He was Doctor Who's most prolific script editor, working on the series in that capacity for five full years, and continuing to write scripts for the series for several years after stepping down as script editor. He also wrote the bulk of the Target novelizations, and served as unofficial editor to that range for just about all of the 1970s. Even after Doctor Who went off the air in 1989 and there was nothing left to novelize, he stuck around and contributed to the long-lived series of original novels that both Virgin Publishing, which bought out Target, and later BBC Books, which took the license back from Virgin in 1997, churned out during most of the 16-year gap between the classic series and the new series. But that kind of familiarity breeds contempt. In being so prolific and writing so many books, Terence's name did become something of a punchline to different segments of fandom. In the years to come after 1974, his novelizations would be very brief and pitched at a much younger reading audience than his earlier work, especially when adapting Graham Williams-era adventures, stories which arguably lack the complexity of the earlier Barry Letts and Philip Pinchcliffe eras, and the various new adventures and Eighth Doctor adventures and Past Doctor adventures, books that Dix, a man in his 60s and 70s, wrote alongside a stable of emerging young writers, primarily in their 20s, were not always as edgy or as richly detailed or as heavy or messagey as many of the other books in those lines. But that's bringing you in at the end of the story. Terence Dix didn't get to write all those books merely because he was a fondly remembered relic. At his best, there's really nobody else who could match his storytelling capability or word choice or dry wit. And Doctor Who and the Auton Invasion is among his very best. Now, this is not a story that Terence can claim all the credit for. He was working from the scripts for Spearhead from Space, and that's a Robert Holmes story. And Holmes was probably the best writer in the classic Doctor Who TV pantheon. A great story can't help but produce a great novelization, no matter who's novelizing. But do this. Call up the online transcript for Spearhead from Space, then glance at it after reading every few scenes from the novelization. Notice something? The scenes in the book go on for much longer than the corresponding scenes on TV. Even minor characters have more to do, and say, and think, and feel in the book than they did on TV. Some of this may be taken from Holmes' original scripts. It's possible that the script editor and the director had to do a lot of pruning of Holmes' words to get the story to fit into four 25-minute time slots. Or, more likely, Dix improved upon Holmes' own work, extending scenes and adding transitional or establishing moments to turn the TV episodes into a proper novel in their own right. And this is what elevates Doctor Who and the Auton Invasion meticulous attention to detail. For this, Dix's first novelization, he pulls out all the stops, adding all sorts of right character asides and a surprising amount of vividly described action and violence that were most certainly not the hallmarks of his later novelizations or his subsequent 30-plus year career writing younger children's fiction. Dix, even at his slimmest, was an expert in providing near-perfect one- or two-sentence descriptions even of the most minor characters. Early in this one, when the Nestian Consciousness's meteorite shower rains bits of Auton upon Oxley Woods in a funnel of superheated air, local poacher, Sam Seeley, blames the freak atmospheric condition on those atom bombs. 
This tells you a lot about Seedley's isolated, paranoid, and conspiracy theory-driven mind. One can well imagine him supporting anyone who's promised to make Oxley Woods great again, or who says the Auton invasion is a hoax. Even Sam Seeley's wife, who does a little on TV, apart from getting menaced by an Auton in episode 3, comes to life here with just a single broad brushstroke. Meg had been married to Sam for over 20 years, Dick says, and by now, she disbelieved everything he told her on principle. Ha! Everyone else gets a zinger here, too, even the most minor of characters. Dr. Henderson, a local physician who tends to the unconscious third doctor in the first half of the story, quote, as always, regretted his quick temper, end quote. Mullins, a hospital porter who unwisely notifies the press about the doctor's alien physiognomy, is a seedy little man, easy to ignore. General Scobie, regretting the complications of his command, in this story and this story only, he's the brigadier's immediate supervisor in the British Army, quote, had a flash of regret for the days when soldiering was simpler. A nice, straightforward cavalry charge now, end quote, he laments. Apart from relishing in the human character's shortcomings, Dix never shies away from stressing the alien nature of the Nestines or their Auton servitors. Of Channing, the Nestine's main agent on Earth, we learn, through the eyes of a journalist, there was something about this man, something odd. The clothes were too immaculate, the handsome features too calm and regular. He looks like a wax dummy, thought the reporter uneasily. Like a waxwork, come to life. And then there's Corporal Forbes, a very small role on TV, whose only job is to get killed by the Autons in episode 2. But Dix takes this most minor of cannon fodder characters, gives him personality traits, and makes far more heroic the manner of his death. As Forbes is sent off on the driving mission that will result in his untimely end, Dix is sure to call him, quote, a very experienced driver. He'd never had an accident in his life, end quote. An effective storytelling technique, letting us know right off the bat that this man is doomed. More than that, in the book, Forbes survives the car crash and has a brief shootout and tussle with a relentless Auton. The giant was by now so close that Forbes plainly saw the line of holes appear across the breast of the dark coveralls. But there was no blood, thought Forbes frantically. No blood. And the thing just kept on coming. Swinging his empty rifle as a club, Forbes landed a tremendous blow on the huge, smooth head. The giant staggered, then smashed the rifle from his grasp, casually, as if swatting a fly. The last thing Forbes saw, as another blow struck him to the ground, was that blank, expressionless face looming over him. Captain Monroe, the unit captain in this story, and there was a different captain in every story in Season 7 before the advent of Mike Yates, is also given several moments which make him far more vivid than on TV. After the brigadier rattles off a string of impossible orders, Dix has Monroe reflect, Is that all, brigadier? He thought to himself. And what do I do in my spare time? Monroe later concealed a grin behind a sudden fit of coughing after the doctor issues a withering put-down of the brigadier, something that many unit subordinates will do in future Dix novelizations. Hibbert, the plastics factory owner who falls under the spell of the Nestines, also receives the POV treatment in several parts of the book. Dix makes us feel sympathetic for the poor doomed fellow, and with several variations of the same theme. Quote, As always, when Channing spoke to him in that tone, Hibbert felt calmed and reassured. A sense of clear-headedness and well-being came over him. It was all so simple. All he had to do was follow Channing's orders, and everything would be all right. He had to do what Channing told him, because... Because... Hibbert found that he couldn't quite remember the reason, but he was quite sure that Channing must be obeyed, that there would be the most terrible consequences if Channing became angry with him. Hibbert's face twitched at the memory of some horror buried deep in his mind. Then he became relaxed again as he heard Channing's soothing voice. The Autons, too, those faceless and voiceless characters, are the earliest beneficiary of a line that Dix would use often to describe not quite alive automata over the years. Dix says it was shaped like a man, but it was not human. Its face was a rough copy of a human face, but blank. Unfinished. Dix also stages a mean action sequence, 
not only did he give Corporal Forbes a longer and more dramatic death scene, he also pads out two other brief TV moments into memorable set pieces. Ransom's quick escape from the plastics factory after the episode 2 cliffhanger goes on for a few more pages in the book. Dix blocks the scene expertly, noting how Ransom inadvertently saves his own life by hiding behind the tank housing the main Nestine body, even though it never actually happened on TV that way for him to block. And then, in the big finale shootout at the factory, Dix gives the Brigadier and unit far more than just five Autons to fight, and a lot more weapons to fight them with. This goes beyond transcribing what happened on the low-budget TV show, and showing us that Dix has a far more vivid, inventive mind's eye than he's often given credit for. The episode 4 material takes up nearly a third of the book, 46 out of 150 pages. Not that Dix even skimped on adapting the first three parts, but he adds a great amount of detail to this final act. The Doctor and Liz's visit to Madame Tussauds is given more space, and the ticket seller is given an expanded role, lamenting that the next Dean's exhibition of civil servants doesn't include enough pop stars. The Autons' actual invasion has greater depth and scope, not just breaking out of shop windows on one London street, but infiltrating the highest levels of government and causing pages worth of chaos. Dix briefly gives the POV of a policeman, who upon seeing an advancement of Auton shop window dummies thinks, students, they'd gone too far this time. That thought was also his last. The doctor finds time to remind us that he's a qualified rocket pilot on the Mars to Venus route. Not a Holmes line from TV, but a Dix original, and one that he was about to plug into his own script for Robot, the fourth Doctor's debut story that was filmed a few months after this book's release. But among all other things, Doctor Who and the Auton Invasion is mostly Terence Dix's love letter to the third Doctor. The Doctor mentally contemplates reversing the polarity of the neutron flow at one point, Pertwee's favorite bit of on-screen technobabble, although he only used the full line once during his five-year tenure as the Doctor. And Dix ends the book with a moment of charm that Pertwee didn't get on TV. Pertwee would later insist on getting a moment of charm for his character in every story, and Dix remembers to retroactively add one here. The doctor put a comforting arm around her shoulders. I think we've won, Liz, he said gently, but the price has been very high. But no price is too high if you find this book marked up secondhand. Own it at any cost. My copy of Doctor Who and the Auton Invasion remains in remarkably good shape, even though I've had it for about 35 years now, and I've read it probably at least a dozen times. What I have is the 1982 reprint with the new cover. Um, my version was reprinted in 1984, but as I'll doubtless have cause to mention many times in future episodes, this was part of the era where John Nathan Turner asked that reprints of Target novelizations not featuring the current TV Doctor not have the Doctor's face on them. So the original cover from the 1974 edition of Auton Invasion is not the one that I have. I have a very 80s book. It's got the neon tube logo in blue outlined in yellow, which is a great color combination, by the way. The cover illustration is the Auton or the Nestine Squid, which is enormous here and it takes up just about the entire cover underneath the neon tube logo, underneath the title and author name, and extend all the way down to the bottom where its tentacles are slapping against the planet Earth. The spine of the book is a pleasing shade of blue with the title and author's name and book number, number six, in white. Remember the book numbers at this point were in alphabetical order, Auton Invasion, beginning with an A, it's one of the earlier numbers, and it's not until book 74 or 75 that the numbers were assigned sequentially to each new book coming out. The back cover blurb has a, a listing for forthcoming titles. Among the many Doctor Who books already available are the following recently published titles, Castor Valva, Ford of Doomsday, Earthshock, Ark of Infinity, Terminus, and Modern Undead. That's an awful lot of Peter Davison for the first book of the Pertwee era. I have the U.S. edition, so it says that it's distributed in the U.S.A. by Lyle Stewart Incorporated, 120 Enterprise Avenue, Secaucus, New Jersey, 07094. And I'm pretty sure that that's no longer in business. The U.K. price 
is one pound fifty, then the American price is two dollars and ninety five cents. Interestingly, the ISBN barcode, which is set in white um, in the bottom right hand corner of the back cover, says the price is one fifty, giving the British price rather than the American price. And in the days before automatic barcode scanners hit most US bookstores, there were many cashiers who probably sold this book for a dollar fifty American. I know it happened to me on one memorable occasion. My copy of the book is marked up, as I did in the uh, 1980s, with the cliffhanger moments. And I must have marked this book up rather late um, in my career of doing this, because I used the on-screen uh, nomenclature of episode numeral 2, for example, and episode numeral 3. Now, there is one cliffhanger that occurs in the middle of the page on the last page of a chapter, and I didn't have time to write episode and the number, so I drew a line in pencil in between the paragraphs, and I put a numeral in the left-hand margin as to where the cliffhanger is. Uh, Terence would later do 12 chapter books, and the cliffhangers would fall neatly at the end of chapters 3, 6, and 9. This is his first time out, so he's not doing that. Uh, episode 3 on TV ends with chapter 8, so chapters 9 and 10, which are the aggregate, like I said, of 46 pages, um, take up episode 4. And again, this book is in remarkably good shape, considering that it has been with me for 35 years and has survived a couple of cross-country moves. The corners are a little worn, but... There are no strange stains upon the spine. There are no creases on the front cover or the back cover. You would never really know that I've read this book as often as I have. The first several Target novelizations did not bear the original episode names. Almost everyone was changed. So the first two books, Spearhead from Space and Doctor Who and the Silurians, are retitled The Auton Invasion and The Cave Monsters. And that tradition would keep up, probably for about the first 18 months of the target line. Also, for that time, the books had internal illustrations. Uh, according to the cover page here, it is Chris Achilleos who does the illustrations. Now, this is the first time, not counting the Frederick Muller books, that the illustrations have captions. So the illustration of someone who vaguely resembles the Third Doctor on page 42 uh, traveling away from the hospital in his, in his wheelchair, has the following caption. The doctor wheezed at tremendous speed down the short, steep hill. On page 65, as the doctor is stealing Dr. Beavis' car, there's a little picture of Dr. Beavis standing behind the car. Stop! Stop! yelled Beavis. Get out of that car at once. And on page 79, when um, the character in the factory is being attacked by the Auton Ransom, a sizzling bolt of energy whizzed past Ransom's head. Whoever wrote those captions is quite fond of the word whizzed, perhaps not aware of the American slang definition of that word. And the Auton doesn't look exactly like TV Autons, but he's standing against uh, what looks almost like uh, what you would see when you look at uh, down a microscope, um, a number of tiny cells in the form of a circle. And there, there's a beam of white light shooting out of the Auton's left hand, just managing to miss Ransom. And Ransom's head is turned, and we're looking only at the back of his head, so you don't get to see the actor's uh, rather crooked smile. Um, this is almost uh, abstract as an illustration, and it's fascinated me over the years, plus the amount of effort that it took to draw all the cells in that big circle in which the Auton is standing. The last illustration in the book is on page 149 of my reprint, and it shows the full nesting squid in a cloud of goo looming over the back of the third doctor's head and Liz Shaw's hair bun. Standing, towering over them, was the most nightmarish creature Liz had ever seen, informs the caption. Yeah, that's not really quite how it appeared on television. Next time? Coming out in the same month as the novelization of the first Third Doctor story is the novelization of his second story, Doctor Who and the Cave Monsters, by Malcolm Hulk. That book is just as good as this one, but for very, very different reasons. And next week, we'll also be joined by a special guest, a very special guest, for the first time on this show. 
thank you for joining me on another episode of the Doctor Who Literature Podcast. I'm Jason, your host and editor and producer. This podcast is brought to you by Anchor and can also be found on Spotify and Google Podcasts. You can find me on Twitter at Doctor Who Novels, that's DR Who Novels. Then you can also find me on the Trap One Podcast. I write about Doctor Who on Twitter using the hashtag Doctor Who Pilgrimage, DR Who Pilgrimage. Please drop me a line with your comments, questions, suggestions. Again, next time, me and a guest are discussing Doctor Who and the Cave Monsters, also from 1974. Thank you for listening, and keep turning the pages. Thank you.